All right, how are we? It's the Late Challenge. It's episode 44. Um, I'm Gareth Roberts. He's Paul Cope. And on this one, we're going to do a footy and sporty type one. Uh, this time around, we're going to momentarily buzz off Man United again. We're going to talk about sim bins and, wh- and more VAR and whether footy is all a bit mad and whether we need those things. And we're also going to have a natter about the mental health of our sporting superstars because that's based on, uh, I've watched that Ronnie film, which is very, very good. Ronnie uh, O'Sullivan, absolute legend of a man, if you ask me. I love him anyway. I've read his books and now I watch the film and we'll come on to talk about that. But uh it was sad, but real and good. What a fella. Um, okay, uh, I wanted to start with Man United because this just sort of made me laugh. Uh, not only have they got holes in the roof, they've now allegedly got dodgy chicken. Uh, and also Alan Shearer reckons they've got some bad eggs in the team as well. So chicken and eggs <laughs> made me laugh anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> proper start uh, off with a proper dad joke. I know. Uh, so Man United are under investigation by Trafford Council after several people alleged they became unwell after being served raw chicken during an event hosted at Old Trafford. United, who declined to comment, are conducting an internal investigation after receiving complaints from guests who attended an event hosted at the club stadium in recent months. The precise nature nature of the event is not known. A spokesperson for Traffic Council confer- confirmed its environmental health team is looking into the matter. Lol. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's just, I, I love it, mate. I just love how many things seem to be shit about them. Do you know what I mean? Like the hole in the roof, the, the, the fucking the fans getting pissed on. Just go and fix the roof. How can you not see it's terrible PR? And now for some reason, allegedly, uh, the dish, you know, dodgy trick and well. <laughs> That's a funny line though, isn't it? The precise nature of the event is not known. I know. Like, like, what? what are, yeah, yeah, it's like a porn <laughs> event. They're fucking, ho- are they hosting only fans now to like yeah. try and get some dough in or something? It is a weird Why line. Why can't they just say it was just a corporate do? Um, yeah, I, w- I was listening to the Gary Neville podcast on the way in and I, I just can't help it. Like I know there's some people who don't like this stuff. Like the, what's the word? Schadenfreude. Yeah. And it, but it's it's life, isn't it? Like it do the, the reality is it does cheer you up. Like especially when you have, I don't think like, the the age group of people who mainly listen to this show will get this because we fucking we were tortured by those fuckers exactly. our whole lives growing up. That's why it's funny. Yeah. So now, and I remember I used to just comfort myself as I got a bit older, thinking everything's cyclical. Like it will come to an end. I've said this to you before about City. It will. It will come to an end with Guardiola. I don't care how much money they've got because money doesn't guarantee you anything you need. The, the difference with City is they've got this own infrastructure and all the rest of it. But United have got loads of fucking dough. And no matter, seemingly, no matter what they do with that dough, it's fucking awful. And watching Neville's got to the point now and it did, it made me laugh because I thought, we've been there, we've talked about it on the show, he doesn't want to watch them anymore. <laughs> like he's sick of them. He's sick of his own club, he's bored of it. And you're like, yeah. And I that, I mean, the other side of it, and this is the, the sad side of footy, isn't it? But I remember when I was, you know, back, back, back in the days when I was a lawyer and corporate events and all that, and they were, their corporate hospitality was the best in the business and, and everything. And even City even overtook them with stuff like that. So for them now to be saving raw chickens to people on top of their dodgy roof, it's just, it's like, what else can go wrong? And and on top of that, they're fucking shite. Yeah. Did you see the thing that Keane commented on? Like the run against um, teams in the top nine away from home? No. And he went, it's like... Oh, they're just terrible away from home. They've, lo- they've like drawn yeah. one in like 15 games or something and the rest they've lost. And he's just like, is that a joke? Is that a wind up? It's, just, it's fucking ridiculous. I'm just trying to find really quickly in a really organised fashion. But as you were just talking, I just remembered that, um, you know, it, there's a massive warehouse or there's loads of warehouses in the by United ground because oh, yeah. it's like, it's Salford Docks basically, isn't it? Um, and yeah, as someone's paid um, for a massive like advert on one of those warehouses, just just basically taking the piss out of them. Um, and it was actually a, a, a United fan who I saw put it up on his um, Facebook just basically saying, you know, like, we're just we're just having the piss taken out of us left, right and centre here, like, do you know what I mean? And, I, and again, I feel like I remember when that was us, do you know what I mean? I feel like when, you know, once upon a time we were that that joke club, if you like, so it is nice to uh, to have it come full, yeah, I've managed to waffle enough that I've found it. United, United have even got checker trade taking the piss now 
with admit this admittedly a very droll and on the nose ad about a hundred yards away from the ground. It's where the old Liverpool warehouse from Euro used to be. Um, this is from uh, Anthony Murphy, a mate of mine who may be listening. Don't know, uh, but yeah, it's big, huge. Um, advert like you know absolutely like what's that it's got to be like I don't know 60 foot 70 foot um, and it's got leaky roof tick leaky defence cross there are some things that even check a trade can't fix <laughs> Boss, isn't it? It's called it's opportunist it. I just it's love it. it it's the side basically the side of a warehouse isn't it yeah. that they've done it on it's, it, it's great like I say it's it's great that it's it, it's them and not us uh, but I just, yeah, and 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 like I don't know. I know we haven't. We're not actually talking about the footy on the uh, the footy on the agenda because we did that the other week. But it is like mad that it's ha- it's happening again, isn't it? It is happening again. Well, the bad eggs things like, like is right. I think there are, yeah. there are too many. Where you know, maybe Phil's been over this weekend and we watched some of their game and we were just like watching it going like, there's just so many players there now that you think. What's he doing at United? Yeah. Like Darlow. Yeah. Or, you know but I, I mean? don't even think that's the worst. Carragher mentioned Rashford. Like I saw a clip of him talking about Rashford and they're your biggest problems. Like that, when, you, when you're homegrown lad who thinks he's boss and he's getting involved in all kinds and everyone raves off him. I've, I've always thought he's just all right. Mm. There, was a, there was a bit yesterday where, well, we'll get into this on our, on our footy show, won't we? But... Mo Salah, who's one of the best strikers on the planet, who isn't a homegrown player, is not a local Liverpool footballer, has got no association with this football club, with our football club before we bought him. When we equalise, he goes and gets the ball out the net and fucking puts it on the centre spot. And then he's fucking tracking back to right back with their winger at one point when they broke. Marcus Rashford, on the other hand, who is homegrown, is a Man United fan, has come through the academy, is fucking throwing his arms up in the air. And I only watch bits of it on Saturday. Yeah, muscling throw- away on the bench yeah, and all and, that. And the commentator saying, I don't think he wants to play right wing. And you're like, oh, poor, poor you, mate. How much are you getting paid a fucking week to play for your fucking boyhood club? And Keane was a, said said this, and I, I'm, I'm into that. And I heard Ali McCoy do the same thing. Um, and didn't swear, but I'm sure they would if they weren't on, like, Joe broadcast TV fuck this he doesn't want to play for the manager you're not playing for the manager Keane said about Ireland he said I wasn't playing for the manager I was playing for Ireland I was playing for my country walked and, out like yeah I know <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was more behind that story but that's what they were saying about Rashford you're not playing for Eric Ten Hag you're playing for Manchester United you're playing for yourself you're playing for the fucking fans who've travelled he weird Ten Hag though. I mean I know we've already done that as a show like, but I mean every time I see him and you know like they, I think they know as well, you know, like the broadcasters know he's weird. It's a bit odd. Because they purposely always like screen a bit of him, like, you know, like walking around the pitch on his own, mumbling to himself, looking like a, you know, a, an old fella that you might see in the park rather than a Premier League football manager. Like, um, yeah, but we don't really want to do Man United. It was just a, a brief, uh, momentarily uh, piss taking type moment. Uh, we're going to talk about Simbins because there's a lot of talk about this, a lot of talk about Simbins, a lot of talk about uh, additional VAR, uh, extending it into um, checking things like free kicks and second yellow cards and corners and all this kind of stuff. Um, I mean, firstly on that, I just think, you know, this International Football Association board that's been discussing whether it should do these things, like, it were you like, you know, because... I, I, I find it strange that, like, you know, it's us, the fans, ultimately, that pay for the game, whether it's going through the turnstiles or paying for TV or buying merch or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And yet, when do you go and ask fans about these things? Do you know what I mean? Like, yesterday, um, as we record, yesterday at Anfield, the first half was basically an hour. Because of, I mean, I know there was an injury and all that. And so there was a long delay for that, the keeper and all the rest of it. But the first half was an hour, essentially. And it's like, how have we got it up to an hour? And you want to fanny around even more, checking things over and over and over. Because loads of the VAR checks were long. Do you know what I mean? You were like, come on. And you're also in the ground with no idea what's no. going on, aren't you? All, you're just all you get is like a mumbled a statement going, yeah. VAR, what? And then you look at the scoreboard and it just says VAR. And you don't know what's going on, do you yeah. know what I mean? Um, but it isn't it. I, I, I like it sound this... if, if you're watching the telly, isn't it? And someone's like, you know, talking you through it. And yeah, they, but even then, we talk they... about this through the week, they don't talk you through it properly, like in rugby, do you? Do no, they, not properly. Like the commentators but they can hear sit there. The co- but I don't get that either. The commentators are sitting there going, we can hear what's going on. And you're like, 
Great for you. Yeah, play what about to us? us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the, I mean, but doesn't this sum it up? Like back on the on our the you know, the the running theme lately about clown world and just laughing at it. With all the fucking mess that's going on with VAR at the moment, and the way fans and pl- you know, pundits and all that are talking about it, if you said to any of them, any of us, do you think we should extend the impact of VAR on the game or reduce it? How many people would say extend it? And the people who run footy are like, I know what we should do. Like, what? Let's use it more. It's like, mad, isn't it? You haven't even fucking boxed off how you're using it now, lads. Why yeah. do you want to use it more? It's mad, isn't it? And, and you know, I listen to a lot of like, um, you know, like I just have talk sports on in the house and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like get up in the morning, make a cup of tea, put that on and it's, it's leave it on all day pretty much. You know what I mean? As I'm pottering around doing what I'm doing. So you hear loads of opinion, obviously you hear loads of fans ringing in. You've got fans ringing in now. Some saying, I've had enough. Like I'm going. I'm, I'm, I'd rather go and watch non-league because like VR is just spoiling it. You've got um, you've got fans ringing in saying things like, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of not bothered if we go down because like in the championship, there's no VAR. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and you're just like, that's how much it's hated. I, I can remember the first time we ever had it at Anfield, like, and it was fucking weird. Didn't know what was going on. And like, you know, you don't know whether to celebrate or not. Um, it obviously takes away that like joy. I mean, you always had the thing, didn't you? That you look, you look at the linesman's flag. Do you know what I mean to see if, if that's gone up or whatever? But now, it, you, you just don't have that spontaneous celebration. You do a bit, but then you're looking, going, "Is it allowed? Is it all right? Is well, that yeah, okay?" I was just thinking this because I wasn't at the ground yesterday. I know we'll, we'll do this on our own on our separate show, but that I think I I remember saying right at the start before it even came in, this is what's going to happen, like for once predicting something right it was like of course that's what's going to happen because it's going to take away the spontaneity of football and the reality is I was going to ask you but I'll tell you how I feel and I guess I guess most people feel the same now even when you're celebrating a goal now you're not celebrating with the same freedom you used to there's like a level of anxiety isn't there because you know there's a chance even if it's this much you're you're literally watching goals now in games and when a goal goes in your brain is thinking trying to assess was there anything that could be yeah, yeah, that yeah. be ruled out for? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm guessing everyone's doing the same thing, aren't they? Hundred percent. Because because when as well it can be like, oh, it, uh, someone handballed it a minute ago, and you're like, what? Like, yeah, he handballed it a minute ago, so we're disallowing that. Yeah, you're that's like, a lose one where yeah. it was pulled back to like about four different phases of play or whatever, and you're like, we've well, already given. Yeah. Like you've already We've been put, playing. We carried on playing. But, I mean, you, you're right there, mate, when you say like, you know, it's mad that they, they seem to be, so they're on about extending its remit to verify and free kicks, check and, sell, yellow, check and second yellow cards that lead to reds and for corners, all areas which you currently can't intervene. Currently referees defer to video replays for scenarios like checking goals, penalties and straight reds. Uh, there have been concerns about lengthy delays in Premier League matches caused by VAR checks. Well, yeah, and like I say, it, it's just all the time. And, and I think it, it's a bit like football's at itself here a little bit in that, you know, I I, I never liked and always used to moan and do content moaning about it. I always used to say, what is with the focus on the decisions? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, since, you know, since I can remember going to footy matches, referees have got things wrong. And we know that, and we call them a wanker or a bastard in the black or whatever. You go and have a pint, and then you like move on, don't you? Unless you're an Evertonian, and you're still going on about fucking Clive Thomas or whatever. Um, but with this, it's like there's full, almost like programs, like devoted to is everything they got wrong this weekend, or you know, I or am justifying a- it, like trying to. Ju- that's the other thing. The Howard Webb one now is trying to justify yeah, that's it, isn't awful. it? That's terrible, that. Um, but you know, you got like people in, in with newspaper columns, ex refs like Peter Walton or Clattenburg or whoever. Every week, I've got a little column in the in the Monday coverage or the Sunday coverage, just saying like, you know, here's what they got wrong this week. Here's what they should have done. And it's like, I, I think we got too focused on that. And VAR has come in as a result of that moaning, you know, like this is going to fix it. And then it hasn't fixed it. It's still shit. There's still human error. And now they're on about, you know, extending it and extending it more and more and more to the point you're like, hang on, where, where's the sport in there that I like? I can't, I can't find it now because we're too busy talking about VAR. I mean, you know, if not us on the end of it this weekend, like, you know, I'm, I'm so, you know, we're fairly happy. And, you know, we went to the pub and watched... Um, City and Spurs 
and obviously it's hilarious because it's them back to the Schadenfreude. Like, um, it's hilarious to see Haaland uh, giving it beans. Well, and, we, but we've said as well, it's also hilarious after what happened to us earlier in the season, and no one seemingly wanted to fucking do anything well, about exactly. it. They so now every time it happens, I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They were all happy to buzz off. But, well, that, that's what I said at the time, wasn't it? I said, you know. It, they, they should have come in behind Liverpool. Yeah. They should have come in behind Klopp and said, look, it's not it's not good enough, this. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're giving it a vote of no confidence here because it's that bad. Instead, they just went, ah, Liverpool, yeah. look yeah. at Klopp going on about replays, the fucking knobhead. And then you've got City today. There's a piece in The Athletic comparing what happened yesterday with, with their, you know, where he wasn't allowed to run through, comparing that to Liverpool against Spurs and saying, well, should there be a replay show to you? And it's like, oh, well, oh, you're interested in that now, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Talk about it, TV. But, but do you know what? Like in fairness on that, and I, I think this is where we are. I think it is eating itself now. I've seen a few pundits commentating on that and all saying the same thing. I don't know what's going through the ref's head. Like he's literally like if he'd blown the whistle for the foul, you'd be like, fine. He should have let it go, but he didn't. He's blown his whistle too quick, but he's let it go. And then as he's let it go, goes, blow the whistle. Yeah. It makes no sense. But and that's the bit where I've got, I have got sympathy for them now. Because the only explanation for that is the ref's heads are so fucked that in the moment he's just, he's gone. Yeah, he's lost it. He? Yeah. His head's just all yeah. over the place. And we all know what that feels like. And once you're in that position and you can imagine yeah, it with the control. VAR, yeah. everyone behind the scenes is pan that's why it, everything's taking longer now I bet you if you did a little study of how long VAR decisions took before that incident with us and Spurs and after I bet you they're considerably longer now because everyone's shitting themselves yeah. so they're all taking longer to look at every fucking decision so all their heads are up their arses they don't there's no accountability no one talks about anything live so now we're just fucked Go on, things just you know, bringing it back to like the sort of the stakeholders in the game if you like if you think about like the running of any big business you know, they have the employ people. I'm fucking applying for the jobs. The, the employ the employ people like in, in stakeholder management. You know, they employ people to mm. communicate to everyone who's got a stake in the process. Yeah. It's not communicated well enough for me, you know, so many aspects of the game now. So, you know, like the, the penalty that was given against Newcastle at the PSG game, where it's it is like then come up onto his hand and they'd give a pen after Newcastle were like resolutely defending this lead they'd got. And again, some aspect of shit on Freud because I'm a Liverpool fan. But equally though, I had so many different takes on that. And I was like, no one knows here, do they? Like, so on the radio, Sam Matterface was saying, the rules in Europe are different to in the Premier League. Yeah. And that's a penalty in Europe. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. Well, why is that a thing? Yeah. Why are they playing to a different rule? Yeah, I, I heard people saying that. And why wasn't it communicated? That wouldn't have been so, given in the, in the English. And uh, you're like, so and then on sorry, TNT, we're playing different rules for different competitions yeah. now. And on TNT, you had Don Hutchinson saying, it's definitely not a penalty because he hasn't get, you know, he hasn't sought an advantage in any way. It's come off his leg onto his hand. But then you had... Um, can't remember his name, the the, the German air journalist. He's always on those types of shows. Anyway, apologies for getting your name your name forgetting your name, mate. But anyway, he's on there and he's going, but by the rules, and this is the rule, and like read it out. And I'm going, okay, so he knows the rule, but Don Hutchinson seemingly doesn't. Doesn't look like Newcastle do, didn't look like Eddie Howe did. And it's like in in a you know, where we are in society with technology and all that, I just don't get, you know, like all the vagaries of handball or offside or whatever. I hear people on the radio and on the TV saying, oh, sometimes the fans don't even get the rules. Sound all right. I don't. Here, here you go. I don't. I'm a footy fan. I've got a season ticket. I love the game. And I don't, I don't get that there's two sets of rules. Come on and tell me why. Or, you know, if you're going to do something about like handball, like you've you've got all the video of all the games that have been played. Surely you can play me a short video of ten incidences of handball and say that's handball this season, and that isn't. Yeah, but that's the problem as well, isn't it? This season, and that's the problem yeah. every season. And I stopped. I used to like look at the updates, and now I can't be asked. It's like you've reached a point, as you say, where nobody knows the fucking rules. How can that be the case? How can it be the case that managers of football teams aren't sure what the handball rule is? They're man that's their full-time job. Like, Why have they made it so like hard? Us. But this is the other thing. 
you, you're taking decisions that are already difficult to make and they're subjective and they're making them more nuanced. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, is his arm outside the, sh the, the shape of his body? Like, what? Is it, is it what? Is it outside the natural shape of his body? How can you put your arm outside the natural shape of your own body? <laughs> Like, isn't aren't your arms always inside the natural shape of yeah. your body? So what the, what are we talking? Like, what are you meant to do when you're running and and things? Yeah. You know, and I'm just trying to find another quote because you know, me me brain's addled by going on the hill basically. But um, I think it was Shankly, wasn't it, that said that it's a simple game complicated by idiots. Yeah, here we are. Well, it, but it, as the world's getting more idiotic, it's it's it's, it's just life imitating art, isn't it? Yeah. It's the the world's getting more fucking crazy. Football's getting crazier because they just and we're gonna go on to about Simbins. They just can't. But it, it's the other side of it, isn't it? It's people justifying their existence. If if you've got a job, if part of your job is creating new rules for footy, and they come to you every summer and go, "Should we have any new rules?" and you go, "No, I don't think we need any." And then the second summer they go, "Do you think we should have any new rules?" and you go, "No, I don't think we need any." Then sooner or later someone goes, "Probably don't need you anymore, do we?" So the people who were making up the rules go, right, how can we keep ourselves in this nice, cushy job? Uh, let's change the air. Uh, let's just let's just dabble with the handball rule again, shall we? It's fucking madness. Still can't find the fella's name. Never mind, eh? Everyone can I'm put, sure he won't be asked. 1,000 people can put it in the comments. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll get 1,000. You'll get how many, how many different journalists do you think we'll get? Names? Yeah, but the smooth fucker with the black hair, do you know what I mean? Um, Connor Steig. Yeah. Connor Steen. Is that it? Honigstein. Honigstein. Rafa Honigstein. Is right, Rafa <laughs> lad. <laughs> I'm sure you're watching. If you're watching, mate. <laughs> okay, no. Uh, that was Graf getting there, wasn't it? Yeah, so the, the Simbin thing, if you haven't heard about this, um, in a bid to tackle growing dissent in the game, the International Football Association Board, them lads again, uh, announced last week that Simbins would be trialled at higher levels after grassroots tests showed promising results. Uh, temporary dismissals <laughs> have been tested in English football across 31 grassroots leagues since 2019, with players receiving a yellow card and then forced to sit out 10, mi 10 minutes of a match. The FA claims it delivered a 38% reduction in dissent and the chief executive, Mark <laughs> Bullingham, has suggested Simbins could also be trialled in the Women's Super League and the FA Cup next season. Uh, they asked some of the managers about it uh, and Pastor Coglu said, uh, been it, mate, been the whole idea. Uh, I don't think there's a need for it. I think you're seeing a lot more dissent in the game these days because there's more a lot there's a, there's a lot more for people to dissent to, more people to dissent to. In the past, it was just referees, but now you can dissent to a fourth official, you can dissent to the VAR, you can dissent to the head of referees. It used to be simple. The authority was with the referee and he could handle it himself. I just don't think we need to mess with the game too much, but it is what it is. I think, don't you think that's a bit of a mad argument because don't get me wrong I think if he'd have just left it as just bin it mate bin the whole thing stop fucking messing with it And because I didn't I, I heard him talking the other week and I quite liked what he said just like a bit like what you started with referee mistakes just used to be part of the fucking game and then we could just now get like on with the game weird and now we've got this hot, yeah a search for perfection that can never be met by the way and it's like everyone's obsessed with it and that's all we ever fucking talk about and it's ruining everything. So let's just fuck it all off and go back to suck it up. When a ref makes a mistake, you just suck it up. And there is a problem with that now because how do you ever go back? And and he's talking about an era when there weren't a thousand replays of every incident. So refs would get away with making mistakes more because you know, every decision they made wasn't being hyper-analysed, which it is now. So I don't think you can go back and I don't know, I don't know what the answer is anymore, but... I think that's a bit of a funny argument. There's more dissent because there's more people to dissent to. Like, what? That's like saying kids are going to swear more if there's more adults to swear at. Like, what? I don't... I mean, I guess he means like the managers and all that as well, doesn't he? Because They're you know, all like, involved. They, can, they, I, it, they give the fourth official shit, don't they? They come and out afterwards. if he afterwards. wasn't there, you wouldn't get it. Yeah, wouldn't they, they just be shouting at the ref on the pitch if that was the case? They come out afterwards and they give VAR shit and all that and they get done for it and they get fined for it. But, you know, they're not going to end up in, I'm presuming they're not going to end up in the Simbin. Yeah, well, that's the point. Simbin isn't to deal with all that, is it? Simbin's to deal with the scent on the pitch. Um, I, I did a bit of reading round around it. Uh, Daish, sorry, I wanted to mention what he said as well. Uh, he said, I don't know why they don't just leave the game 
team alone at times. I don't think it's needed. I don't think it's wanted personally. Maybe fans have got a different view. Yeah, no one would you, mate? Um, how are you going to manage it? If a player goes off the pitch, how are you going to manage that? The health and safety? Is he warming up or is he allowed to sit down? Does he have to stay sitting down? Does he get two minutes out of the 10 minutes to warm up again? Just forget it. I don't know why they keep interjecting themselves. This is the IFAB into the game. I'm with them on that as well. There's not that much wrong with the game. I think once they throw an idea like that out, it usually means they've tested the waters. They have indeed shown and it does look like it's going to happen. Uh, I like this though. And this was like a bit of an in, a, a, a different take but interesting uh, so Exeter's uh, rugby director bear with me don't hang up um, I know it's egg chasing um, Rob Baxter he said um, he, he thinks the lawmakers should be careful um, after they agreed that Simbin should be trialled um, blah 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 he says I'll be honest with you I'm very surprised football are doing it he said, I was a bit surprised when football went to VAR and I'm not sure how much they realised they were letting the genie out of the bottle. We're meddlers in sport and rugby is the worst of the lot. We, we have actually realised that we want less television match official intervention. The international game is saying we need less TMO intervention. Uh, intervention. All the commentators and ex-pro footballers are saying we need way less VAR interference. And if this does happen, it has to happen quickly and the crowd needs to know what's about what it is about because it's causing mayhem in big games. Once you start the process, it's very hard to stop tinkering with it. They're tinkering all the time. One of the things that football's always had as its strength is that everyone can explain the rules within five minutes to your average new supporter and they'll get it. My advice to football would, would be, be careful. Do you think you, gen you genuinely need it to improve player behaviour or do penalties, free kicks and yellow cards as they stand, which can escalate to reds for a double yellow, have they got the sanctions already within their game to control player behaviour and they just haven't been using them? That's what I see in football. They have got the sanctions available, use them. For player abuse, you only need to do it in one or two games and things change very quickly. Introducing yellow cards and removing players from the pitch is something I would be very careful of. Um, so he's, he's basically saying sort of what I was saying at the top, that you know, just constantly trying to mess with things just seems a bit unnecessary. I mean, we had it again, uh, to use the Anfield example this weekend. One thing I really, really, really don't get is why goalies are so freely allowed to waste time. And it's so solvable. Walk up to him, mm. give him a yellow card and say, you do that one more time, lad, you're off. Mm. He won't do it. Mm. He won't do it. He'll take the free kick. He'll take the goal kicks quickly. He'll stop fucking around. He'll stop lying on the ball. He'll stop banging his studs on the post or deciding he wants to take it from the other side now and all the rest of it. But we had that at Anfield with, with Fulham's goalie. Not a thing was done about it. They literally come out and made a massive deal at the start of the season of we're cracking down on that. You, you, have you stopped already then? But that's the problem with this, isn't it? And he, it's interesting hearing someone say about that because I've referenced rugby a few times lately and obviously I'm not a rugby fan, so I'm, I'm not aware that they're obviously they're obviously sick of their own VAR. Um, but it's a good point, isn't it? Like, yeah. you've already got the things that you need in place. Just use them. Because what he says there, things would change quickly. Imagine what would happen if in four games running, someone got sent off inside a game, like a goalie got sent off for time-wasting. He got booked in the in the tenth minute and got booked again in the sixtieth minute, yep. and just went, "You're off, mate." There'd be fucking uproar, and then the ref. And this is the mad thing about the refs. If I was the refs and I was Howard Webb, I'd say I want to come out after the game and I'll back up my own fucking decisions, yep. and I'll say we told him before the game, no time wasting. I booked him. Well, like we said, Joe, you get a grace period, but by the tenth minute, if you haven't listened to me, I'm going to book you. So I booked him in the tenth minute, and then he didn't stop. So I booked him again, and it'd be the same for everything else, wouldn't it? Like. If, you, if you're getting a booking for descent and then you're putting in a late challenge and you're getting sent off and the ref's going, it's tough. It's just tough. Stop, stop fucking giving me grief on the pitch or I'm going to book you every fucking time. But then the flip side of that is you've got to create an environment in which you can have a proper conversation on the pitch the way the good refs do. Talk to me properly. You can talk to me and we can talk about it, but you can't swear at me and you can't you know, be offensive towards me. We've got, we want a bit more respect in the game. Do that at grassroots level as well. But th this is the problem. Even as I said that, it's like <laughs> at grassroots level, well, what you've got to also stop then is behaviour of parents on the touchline mm. going off and people kicking off and stuff like that. Yeah. 
This I mean, is a, it, it's a wider problem. On on that on that time, with someone as, as well, I just think like you know, you imagine you're in the ground and and you're seeing it and you're getting frustrated with it, and we all you, you know we all shout and we all were all there. I was doing it myself yesterday, you know, like fucking hell, ref, time waste and have a way with them. Do you know what I mean? If he, if he blew, you know, couple of, couple of blasts on the whistle, walked over to the to the goalie as he's fucking round with his goal kick and knock or you know, and went to him, went to that as watch like that, so. It was, performatively so we can all see what he's talking about and said right first warning on that next time you're booked time after you're off and as you say start sending them off it'd go there's no way they'd risk that because it's such an important like position isn't it and there's such a drop off as well between 100%. first and second you know goalies as we'll, we'll no doubt talk about on our uh, on our Liverpool show but I, I don't get why they like sort stuff like that out before you, <laughs> well, you want to bring in a completely new I'll thing with Simbins. I'll give you a dramatic example, which I do. I'm reluctant to say out loud because you can open a can of worms. But do you remember in the Qatar World Cup when all the teams were get all the nations were getting together, the European nations saying, I think we should take a stand. I think we yeah. should wear rainbow armbands and all that. And FIFA, I guess, said, if you do that, we are going to book your captains at kickoff. Every one of your captains is going to get a book and a kickoff. What happened? The old jib. The, the, the old jib. The old shit. The captain. Because they all thought, "Fuck it, we don't want to." Because what if Harry Kane gets booked the kickoff, and then he gets booked twenty minutes later, and he's fucking off? So that perfect example of, and that's it. We're talking about something that was a fucking important topic that they all just jibbed when there was a threat of a yellow card. It shows you how it fucking fucking work. Yeah. And that was in a, a a way I don't approve of. By the way, that that use of it. But do the same here. Just fucking clamp down. I mean, Bullingham, when he's trying to... So, like, you can tell that he knows there'll be pushback on the Simbins by the way he talks about it. Because he says, the success of Simbins in grassroots has been prevention rather than cure. So you get to a point where people know the threat of Simbins so they don't transgress. And we would hope it would make the same change. But I think what's what what's, what's we're saying, and, and that's what the, the rugby lad said as well, you've already got this stuff. You've already... You know, you don't need... You know, don't, don't need the Simbin. I mean, I just can't be arsed with it, me. I, I just think, like, you know... Well, it ruined uh, the game. That's what I think... But that's it, what other people have been saying. What like, about all the offshoot things that would happen if you have it? So, you know, like, if you if you if you know you're down to 10 men for 10 minutes, what are you going to do then? Exactly. Time waste. Yeah. You can take the ball in the corner, lie down, feign injury, do all that bollocks well, until just, you've got your man back. Exactly. That's exactly it. And they're not thinking about that at all, are they? It'll just ruin the game for 10 minutes at a time. And because what's the thing? You'll, at the very least, you'll go fucking defend most. Other well, fucking post the cogley. We'll just if he's down to three men, he'll keep fucking attacking with Eric Dyer on the halfway line, having sprints <laughs> against whoever he can. Um, but everybody else will just go right. Just shut up shop for ten minutes. So, so the game's going to be fucking ruined. Um, it says some of the offences that will be uh, deemed worthy of punishments include questioning an ofi- official's ability, slamming the ball into the ground and sarcastically clapping. Did you see Lewis Dunks um, sending off the other week? No. Oh, it was absolutely tremendous. So he got booked and then he called the referee a fucking bellend. Did he? And he got, he got a second, got a second yellow. yellow for that. But, but you can see on the TV coverage, the referee, like, there's like, you know, one of Dunk's teammates is alongside the ref going, you know, what, what's going on there? And you can see the referee say, he called me a fucking bellend. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's absolutely tremendous. But that's a perfect, like even Dunk's laughing himself. Do you know what I mean? But that's a perfect example of it, isn't it? Yeah. Lewis Dunk will probably not call a ref a fucking bell end again, will he? Because he got sent off for it. Yeah. Um, uh, with this as well, like, you know, there's loads of like w- questions that I think, you know, they, they've got to sort of communicate or iron out as well. Like, so if you're getting 10 minutes, well, what happens if there's not time to get the 10 minutes? Like the next game, do you like have three minutes where you can't come on the pitch? Do you know what I mean? But he has to be selected. It's just weird, and I just can't be arsed with well, it. Like did you, the VAR's bad enough. Like just leave it. Like you know what I mean. Did leave you see the, the game clip alone. Of that quote you read out of Deitch, I saw him say it in it. Like when you see how he how he delivered it, and as he's saying it, clearly like the journalist he was saying it to in a press conference must have laughed. And Deitch went to him. I'm being serious. Yeah. Because he was doing the whole, or do all the questions. So what, what does it mean? Can he sit down? Can he stand up? Can he warm up? Can he, does he just have to be completely, and then how, what, how often will that player get injured then? Think about the temperatures, like over the past week and over Christmas in January, February. Yeah. So you're going to take a high, like an elite sportsman off the pitch 
and I'm sports woman, I suppose, if, if they're going to bring it into the women's yeah. game as well. You're going to bring heart these athletes, drops heart rate and drops, the rate drops, muscles yeah. cool down. Yeah. Like, then they just stood there. What, what are we going to go back to? Remember when um, Coleman the bikes. had the bikes on the side? <laughs> You're going to say what that. What the fuck? Like, that, it? Just, oh, fucking mental. Yeah. But just, it, it is, it, for me, it does come down to people going, yeah, well, I get paid to do this. So let's let's try that and we'll see. Well, the FA said that um, in 25 of its 31 trial leagues, there'd been a reduction in descent and tellingly the overwhelming majority of players, coaches and officials wanted the sin bins to be continued. So they'll say that they're doing what I'm saying they should do. They'll say, we've we've consulted with the stakeholders of the game, i.e. players, coaches and officials, and they want it. But we're stakeholders as well. Do you know what I mean? We pay good money to go and watch this every week. And I'm not sure there's a big fucking, like, you know, Dice said, didn't he? Oh, well, I don't know what the fans think. I'm not seeing loads of fans clamouring for fucking Simbins. No, and, and let's, like, let's be clear as well. This is, I think this is a weird thing, right? 25, it's 31 trials. They were in grassroots footy. Yeah. That's not, it's not the same game, is it? Grassroots footy doesn't have VAR. It's not the same mm. fucking game. It's completely different. We're talking about lads playing on a Sunday league. That's grassroots footy. Leading against the post, fucking skinning <laughs> yeah. up and that just before yeah. Yeah. before they kick off. Do you yeah. think, like, and you're going to the managers <laughs> as it worked in, you're like, yeah, well, it's, uh, it's helped stop some of our lads go out on a Saturday night, to be honest. So that's fucking helped us out. It's a fucking different thing. You can't use that as your trial and then say, we. I've got this big thing recently. Whenever I hear this, people talk about like, whenever they've done a trial, a scientific trial or whatever it is, and like, and 60% of that showed this. And you're like, yeah, but that... So what? It, that doesn't mean it should be done. It doesn't mean it works for everything. It's not. It's. It's not. It doesn't always translate across to what you're trying to translate it across to. Exactly. Well, we're going to move on. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, mental health in uh, sport. Did, have you watched the Ronnie thing? No, I haven't got round to it yet. It is on my list though. So yeah. I, I mean, I should have done before this, but that goes with something we talked about off air, wasn't it? About it's really good. Time. Yeah, it's really good. Um, and it's really honest and it's really quite sort of eye-opening. I saw Ian Wright say it's like the best one he's ever seen. Yeah, like, I, it, it's, 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 it's like unbelievably honest, do you know what I mean? In terms of like, you know, it, it shows you. Like he's mic'd up and he's playing like Judd Trump and like, you know, he's muttering to himself, he's giving himself loads, like, do you know what I mean? He's really on his own back. You see him in the breaks and he's like, you know, got the window open and the change, he's having a biff that out the window and that. And, and like, he's just a complete bag of nerves. And like, what I've always liked about Ronnie O'Sullivan is, to my mind, he's cool as fuck, isn't he? Yeah. Like, an unbelievable player, like going out and playing left and right handed and all that. Mm. You know, fastest time for a 147, all of those things, like... And like here he is, like um, looking unbelievably vulnerable. Do you know what I mean? And talking about how, how much the game gets to him, and how much the crowd gets to him, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it, it's a fantastic watch. It's really well made. Like, well, on that point, before you go on, did you did you have you watched the the overlap he did with? Oh, it's not an overlap. It's with it's the new one. Stick to football. Stick to football. With Neville and Carrigan and all that. So there's good. a bit where he, he yeah, really good. And it, but there's a bit where he mentions that one four seven, and even that's fascinating. Because he's like, Joe, you know, they were saying, obviously, it's amazing. And he went, I only did that. I, I hated doing that 147. I, I only did it that fast because I was so in my head and I was like questioning everything I was doing that I just had to play that fast to stop myself. To shut him go up. off. Shut, shut. Yeah. Like to end the It was just like, just keep, just keep playing. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. just, just get down and take every shot as quick as you fucking can before like the fucking demons come in and get fucking get on top of you. And you're like, fucking hell. And he said that year, yeah, he, he, didn't, he didn't win the title that year because he was just fucked. Inside yeah. zone head. Well, and that's what drove across, yeah. the fastest 147 of all time. Well, there's more and more conversations about this now, isn't there? And, you know, we've had conversations on here before about it and about, about both sportsmen and our own uh, mental health. Man, shite at the moment, I would say. Um, but Owen, <laughs> Owen Farrell is another one who's, who's um, he, he's, he's a place for. He plays for England doesn't he? he's a England rugby player. Uh, he says he's, he's having time away from England duty to care for his mental health after a period of huge pressure and criticism. Um, and like, there was a good piece. There was a good piece in the Times by Matt Dickinson where he was just sort of saying, and I, I still don't think there's enough of this type of conversation. I think, I think, you know, the way we talk as a nation about sport and the pressure we put on them and like how how much mistakes are analysed to like the nth degree. It it, it, it just, 
it is an unbelievable pressure, isn't it? And, and like we always do it, and you did it before. We're all guilty of it at times. You do the, how much money did he get paid? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it's not. It, that isn't a correlation. Like money's me ass. You know what I mean? Like sound okay. You can buy better clothes, drive a better car, and go and buy a bigger house. But sound. But but you know, if you can't sleep at night because your brain's chatting in a way and it's saying the wrong things, mm. that affects anyone and everyone. Yeah. And and you know, just because you're like a top level sportsman, it can affect you as well. And I just think as well, you know, the, we're so ingrained into technology as well now, and you know, phones are never out of our hands. And you know, there's a lot of players I know. Who, who choose never to look at social media, but it must be incredibly hard. I, I, I used to say this even to when when I interviewed players, I used to ask them about what they thought about the media, never mind social media. Mm. And loads of them, the answer would be, "I don't read it. I don't read the papers because that's you know that, that that's where we were." Then this is sort of like you know way way back. But now you've got, you still got the papers you still, and you've got more media and you've got 24 seven football media as an example. Then you've got social media on top of that. And I, I imagine if you're, you know, a player or a sportsman or a woman at any level, anything you put up, it's going to get bombed with balance, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Like you, you, you put up a picture of you and your kid or something. The comments are going to be about what you did on Saturday or when you missed this or when you said that or when you did this. Um, you know, we mentioned Harlem before, didn't we? He's obviously like gone with his, gone with what the fuck, hasn't he, on um, mm. Twitter? Mm. And like, he, I imagine he's getting a shitload of abuse as a as a result of that. Mm. And whether you agree with his his rage or not, or whether you thought it was funny or not, I'm presuming if he's gone on there and put what the fuck, at another point he's going to go on and look what the reaction to it is, and loads of it won't be good. And like, I don't know, you got to be pretty like thick skinned to take that, haven't you? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, social media conversations are like it's almost a separate arm of this whole thing. Cause it's it's funny when I used to say before, yeah, do I did the how much is he, do, is he getting paid? And that for me is a he's not running around enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like if you're getting paid that much, it's it's like this, Joe. You know, well, it's like anything you do. If you're gonna turn up and do it, do it. Like yeah. do it to the best you can on that day. And if you've got poor mental health and you and you're struggling, well. We need to create an environment in which you can say, I can't play today. Do you know what I mean? I can't do this. Like, I think one of the reasons we like doing this is if you're having a bad day, you can come in, and it, it helps in a way. You get to have a rant yeah. or whatever and you get, like get stuff. Yeah. yeah. And um, and I've, I was thinking about that about footballers last week because a lot, a lot of the stuff I, I look at now for, in my own life as well is um, healing like physical things through emotional work. And, and, and a part of that is, Literally, animals do this. There's books about this. Like, animals shake off trauma. They physically shake it off. So, so running around doing physical activity is good. That's one of the reasons it's good for mental health, because you're literally shaking off yeah. physical trauma. But I got told to, that it, like, a, a quick fix if you're feeling, like, an anxious or, you know, like, your, your head's chocker or whatever, and you just have one of them time. If you literally, like, brush it as though, like, you were brushing hair off your clothes or your legs or whatever, you know what I mean? Do yeah. that. That can help. Yeah. That can help ease it. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. you're almost like brushing away the. Well, we'll think the about it like this little, we'll like cross over into my into my other podcast now, won't we? But um, think about it from like a, a biological perspective. I like to, you know, I like to break stuff down. Like what emotions? Are, no one talks about this stuff, right? And I had to figure this out for myself as I was figuring stuff out over the past few years. An emotion is a chemical reaction inside your body and my body. So as as we build up these chemical reactions and no one teaches us what to do with them. That builds up inside you. And if you literally, there's a book by a guy called Peter Levine, I don't know whether you've ever read this, called Waking the Tiger. Um. And it's about this. And it's like, go and watch like documentaries about animals and watch a zebra when it's just been attacked by a lion and it got away. The next thing it does is properly fucking shake. And it's doing basically what you're talking about, do you know what I mean? It's, it's fucking releasing shaking off and releasing. Of it's releasing yeah. the emotions it's just built up. But we don't do that. We just sit behind desks all day. We don't have a very, our, our society has become very sedentary. Yeah. And so we're all dealing with this shit. The, one of the, on another segue, one of the dead interesting things about the Ronnie O'Sullivan thing that I thought, and this came from the, um, the podcast they did with Neville and Carragher and Keane and Ian Wright. They were all talking about addictions being a good thing for sports people. Because Joe, if you, you channel your addiction, that's what the, and I, 
it, like, and look, I, I have to do that thing, don't I, where I go like, who am I to question the likes of Steve Peters, who's clearly a very famous psychologist and trusted by Liverpool and England and Ronnie O'Sullivan. Ronnie O'Sullivan yeah. I completely disagree with them, completely disagree with them. Like there's too much for me of managing this stuff, like just accepting that if you've got an addiction, well, all right, it's better to be addicted to high performance sport than it is to be addicted to heroin. And you're like, well, of course, but not for your own fucking mental health. It's not. Do you know what I mean? And this it is might what make you a better say. sportsman. Yeah. It might make you more driven, but it's fucking you up. Yeah. So actually what you need to do is solve the what's underneath the addiction. And none of them were talking about that, which baffled me. It was, yeah. I, thought it was I, I, th I think you're onto something. It was a point that I wanted to try and make in this chat as well about if you think about what a sportsman or woman is, like... It, it it mostly is an addictive thing, isn't it? Like you you look at Ronnie's backstory and the amount of snooker he's played to be that good. You know, like we can go okay, ten thousand hours and all that. Well, it'll be well more than that. One, but two, it, it's like it's not normal. Do you know what I mean? Like to be that good, the dedication you've had to put in to reach that level. Okay, to was it you know lame and it, it looks cool as fuck that he just like strolls out there and he's absolutely brilliant and he does stuff you couldn't. You can't compute when you go and have a go yourself. But equally, like, to do it, there's so much of life that you've tripped. There's so many things that you haven't done. Do you know what I mean? There's huge sacrifices you've made to get to there. And that that isn't respected or, or, or talked about enough, is it? And I, I, think, I think what's interesting now is that there are more documentaries, there are more books, there are more just sports men and women who are prepared to come out now and say, this totally did me in. To, to win this Olympic gold medal yeah. or to play for England or to do this. Like, you know, it, it, it wrecked my head, basically. You know, you've got like Ben Stokes, the, the test cricket sk um, skipper, took a six-month break in 2021 for anxiety, including panic attacks. Um, I mean, there was a thing in the Ronnie thing as well. You know, he, he talks a lot about his dad and obviously his dad went in Nick and all the rest of it. Um and he talks about, like, his dad said to him, like, win it for me, sort of thing. And, like, you know, he sort of knew that his dad was watching it inside and all that. And that just made it worse, do you know what I mean? Like, he's got to, like, go and box this off for his, his jailbird dad, like. But this is the mad thing, and, I, and it's for, it would be funny, before I even watch the documentary, right, I could, I could write you a five-point, bullet-point summary of Ronnie O'Sullivan's life. Because once you've like delved into this world, and it sounds like I'm blowing smoke on my own arse here, but I'm, I'm trying not to, because once you, like, you've spent so much time looking at this stuff, it becomes so simple and so basic. And then you see the same pattern, and I'm conscious this could be confirmation bias, but the same pattern repeats constantly. So you see, like I saw a clip of someone <laughs> Fucking hell. Uh, mentioning, I, I love mentioning Elon Musk. Every time I mention Elon Musk, it, you get like, loads the comments of comments, just, yeah. yeah. Your opinion, and it's funny how many people tell me what my opinion should he's a, be. He is a weirdo, lad. I know, mate. I know. <laughs> I've never said he isn't. It ties into this. He's a fucking oddball. Yeah. I call, my, my theory is he's an alien. It's funny that people miss that bit, yeah. don't they? Like, Kopi likes Elon Musk too much. I've, my theory is he's a fucking alien. But how much more do you want me to say? Do you know what I mean? He's a fucking weirdo. But even, I saw a clip of, um, of do you know the, the biographer, Walter Isaacson? He's done, he did Steve Jobs, he's done Leonardo da Vinci and he's, he did the Bartlett interview podcast a couple of weeks ago and I saw a clip of it and he was talking about Musk's childhood. Guess what? Paint by numbers of all the stuff I've learned. Like it all goes back to childhood trauma and then basically a lifetime of trying to prove yourself to someone yeah. and then that often is layered with somebody saying to you, I saw it with Jordan Henderson, go and do this for me from like your dad who's got cancer or your dad who's in prison or yeah. don't let me down. As, you're like, fucking hell. Well, the, the, the pressure on people. Some good stuff in this, that that, that Matt Dickinson piece, which I sent you where he, he says, I'm not sure we pause enough to consider the amplification of expectations even before we get to abuse. As someone who can feel angst over a golf shot in front of three people, there are many times I'm in awe of how sports stars perform in the good times, never mind when they're wobbling under pressure or feeling like they're letting down the world or knowing that thousands want them to crumble 
Campbell. Practice, flow, unthinking action. Many work with sports psychologists to develop an array of different tricks to conquer mental obstacles, shutting out any forces that conspire against them. But given those f- harmful voices can often come from within and relate to all kinds of personal history, increasingly there are discussions around whether talk and therapies should play a greater role in professional sports. The most recent edition of New Psychotherapist carried a piece about how sport and therapy are slowly coming together. Tony Bloom, who became the first therapist employed by a professional football club at Oxford United, is one evangelist. He said, football clubs are only waking up to the realisation that when people have off-field issues, they inevitably end up on the field. More clubs should be employing psychotherapists who are able to mix and mingle freely with players and warn them of the consequences if they don't clean up their personal problems. Now, there's a thing with this. I've read about this a lot and like I've written pieces about it. We've talked about it on air before. And I think it's a really, it's a weird environment. In fact, we we, we both know someone, don't we, who's working with sportsmen um, at, a, at a sports club in this type of role that they're talking about here. I always think it must be weird. And how do you get it over to the player if you, you, you say to them, listen, you can come and talk to me and it will not affect what the manager thinks about you being able to play with the first team. Because everything is geared to that, isn't it? You want to be in the first team. You want your place. You want to play in the big games. So if you go and see him, are you showing weakness? Are you highlighting something where that might get fed back to the manager and you might not get picked? I think that's got to be one of the biggest barriers for them. 100%. I, I've worked with someone I coached a long time ago and um, they were t- they told me something very serious that had happened in their life that was underneath every problem they had. And they, I knew they'd been working with a therapist and I, and I said to them, Did you, have you told your therapist this? And they said, no. And I said, why? And they said, the therapist is paid for by my employer. And that wasn't a sports person. Mm. It was just a, a normal person in yeah. a normal job. And they were like, and I just, there's just that, all it, it doesn't even need to be like, I don't trust them. There's just that tiny percentage risk. And that tiny percentage risk was too great. So they wouldn't say anything. And speaking from experience, if you don't tell therapists, coaches, whoever you're working with, everything, there's only so much they can fucking do. Of course. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And so I've seen that in in action in real life. I'd be amazed if that wasn't a huge thing in sports clubs. Well, there's a Bradley Wiggins bit in this piece as well where, um, you know, his training was just off the charts. Um, and um, it says here, was, was celebrated, you know, but it's since been revealed that he, he, he was subject to childhood abuse and obviously that was affecting him. And that, that was his way, of, almost like that was his way of dealing with it. He threw himself even more into the training. He threw himself into like going faster, harder, further and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And he said, what what uh, Matt Dickinson saying in his pieces, he said that there seems to be a thing, almost a fear in sport that opening up old wounds and finding balance, even ease with the world could take off the driven you know, winning edge. Like, you know, like you're this good because you're proving someone wrong. You're this good because you're burying something else. Um, You know, he says, Matt there, do not tamper, block off complex issues or use them as fuel. Um, That's long been a way of thinking in sport. Um, But he says about Stokes, like ultimately it sort of, you know, it it came back through again. Um, You know, one of his, one of his difficulties was dealing with the death of his father. Um, do, you know, do you know what though? I've had this conversation with people as well in the past. People have asked me this question, and i I don't think it's I don't think it's healthy to dismiss that. Like so, to to say to elite performers, don't worry about that. Don't worry about taking your edge off. I think is is wrong. Like I don't think it's the right advice because there is a risk. There is a risk that. If what drives you is the trauma that you're running away from, and that's what's underneath the addiction, there is a risk that if, if you take away that trauma, you deal with it, you find balance, you will, you, know, you get ease with the world. There is a risk, and telling people there isn't a risk isn't healthy. Yeah. So, and I've had I had this conversation with um, Steve Warnock. Do you have to? I did a YouTube interview with him a um, couple, couple of years ago, and after after I'd coached him and. I asked him the question, do you think if you'd have done this work when you were playing, it would have helped you? And he said, yes. And that's my big thing. I think it depends on the 
the sport and it depends on the person. Yeah. And it's something I like, I'm keen to like get into. So if there's any, if, you know, any golfers or snooker players out there who want to try this, I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to try this. I think especially in sports like that, tennis, golf, snooker, where you're spending most of your battle, actually, once you're good at what you do, most of your battle is internally inside your own head. It's not a driven thing. Whereas, so I'd be confident if you worked, you know, with footballers, tennis players, golfers, um, snooker players with this stuff, it would improve their performance because psychologically they would, and emotionally, they'd be more equipped to deal with what they want to deal with. If a boxer came to me and said, do you think I should do this? I'd be like, depends if you want to carry on being a fucking boss boxer. Mm. Because... You can imagine like it's, anger fuels, yeah, fuels that and well. Look, but even in I mean, that, I, you know, I'm I'm not a sportsman by any stretch of the imagination, but I used to really enjoy playing squash. Then I put my shoulder out, and I like I haven't, I haven't here, I haven't had to go since. I'm a bit, I'm a bit wary of it to be honest about mm. whether I would go and do it again. But if I'd had a bad day, which I seem to have a fair view of them, like um, I fucking loved going out and having a game of squash and like just swatting a ball basically yeah because it was just a great way to get take take it out on something yeah but that you know it, it doesn't do anyone any harm me hitting a squash ball dead yeah. hard do you well, know what I mean well and what you've just described that like Joe you know, at our level is the same as what Customato did to Mike Tyson at, a, at the elite level which we we mentioned on a show a couple of weeks ago I think which yeah I can I've said this to people in the past if you want to come to me with your problems and have me help you turn as Tony Robbins did it with Conor McGregor. Do you remember the Conor McGregor fight where he knocks someone out in like three seconds? He'd been working with one of the most famous coaches on the planet, Tony Robbins. But all he's doing is taking all of his fucking problems and directing it at something yeah. and going, right, use that to smash that fella's face in. Well, guess what? Conor McGregor's still fucked up when he leaves that ring. Of course. And it, like Mike Tyson was still fucked up when he left the ring. Yeah. There is a counterpoint to this though, which I think we mentioned as well, which I do have a, a, a theory that, because if fight and think of Floyd Mayweather as a boxer, for example, arguably one of the greatest pound for pound boxers of all time, if it's more about staying calm inside your own mind and controlling your emotions and not flying into rages, maybe it would even help in fighting sports. But I, I do think I think this is the future. I think we will we will come to a point in the next 10, 20 years where this type of work will be commonplace. And it's and people will look back and go, it's mad it wasn't always like this. Someone else commented uh, in the last week or so that it, it does look like once again that we are uh, you know creating a podcast in a funeral parlor. <laughs> in a creme. Um and I'm just noticing the uh, the curtains slightly moving there, which is a, a bit a bit uh, you know, like <laughs> Are we in a funeral parlour? Is that a ghost? Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, the Ronnie O'Sullivan film uh, is, called, double up is called Edge like of Everything, by income. the way. What? For income purposes, we could double up. Yeah, why not? Start doing um, Ed, go on, sorry. I'm not going to rule like anything out, to be honest, at this stage. Um, Edge yeah, of Edge everything. of Everything, if you want to uh, catch up with that Ronnie O'Sullivan film, it is really, really good. I uh, would recommend it. Uh, just going to squeeze the fact in before we go. Um, want, thanks once again to Ken Pye. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't watch or listen, uh, but Ken uh, is keeping these facts going some weeks where... Basically, I forgot to do something <laughs> or think of one or look one up or I've got a hangover or I'm having a shit day. And then I take Ken's book off the shelf, find one and go, that'll do. So thanks to Ken. For, we've got another fact about Merseyside this week. The book, if you want to buy it, uh, well, this particular one is called More Merseyside Tales, Curious and Amazing True Stories from History by Ken Pye. There's, like, there's a series of them. I would say if uh, you know someone like me in your life who likes a bit of local history, etc., they would appreciate one of Ken's books. Uh, so I'm just going to read this out to you. Um, it's about Bootle, uh, a place where I found myself the other day uh, with Phil looking for somewhere where Phil could change some old uh, sterling into cash that he could actually use. Uh, we got there in the end, uh, but we had a good tour of the Strand. Nice. Uh, <laughs> hey, that was an eight day. <laughs> That's something you never thought you'd see, isn't it? I know, comes over from Dublin for yeah. a bit of sightseeing, go with the match. Go with the That's all the strand, lad. Um, That's proper tourism, that though, isn't it? I used to love that when you go travelling somewhere. Take me somewhere the locals go. Yeah. <laughs> you end up in a fucking shitty shopping centre. Well, Bootle, as I was explaining to Phil when we were walking around, was completely raised to the ground by... Um, by, by in the war mm. by the Luftwaffe. Um, it was um, one of the most bombed places in the country. Um 
But during the 18th and 19th centuries, Bootle Village became the home of many wealthy businessmen from all over Liverpool and South Lancashire who appreciated its rural peace and beauty. This helped Bootle to rapidly become a fashionable seaside resort, particularly because of its long stretches of golden beach and sand hills. At that time, uh, they graced the shores. Uh, that's, that's shit, the way you've written that, Ken. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> basically, uh, attracted many hundreds of people each summer for their health and recreation. Many people, especially young men and boys, but some girls and women too, came to the Bootle Strand from Liverpool, not the shopping centre, to go bathing and swimming in the river. Of course, they did not have bathing costumes and wouldn't have bothered to wear them as they as thrown and frolicked in the water as nature intended. But this flaunted nudity outraged the sensibilities of the socially aspirationally fam- uh, socially aspirational families sauntering along the sands in their smart suits. And a local bylaw had to be passed to prevent nude sea bathing at Bootle. But the demand was still there. And it's here where an enterprising Liverpool solicitor by the, the name of William Spearstow Miller began to rent out bathing machines for the swimmers. These were like large sheds on cartwheels with a door at each end, and they had high windows in them for light, air, and discretion. Fully clothed bathers entered them through the rear door and closed this behind them. They'd get undressed, while horses or strapping young men towed them out into the water. They could then come out of the other door and into the water, um, and, you know, saving their decency basically. Um, so that, if you know Bootle, all of this is a bit mad, isn't yeah. it? Do you know what I mean? Uh, you it was, bring them back. It was very popular. He, it created some considerable wealth. And uh, he, he then went on to build a huge mansion house for himself on the shoreline called Miller's Castle. He also built the local church, St. Mary's, in 1826. And he named it Derby Road uh, in honour of Lord Derby. Uh, it is now, obviously, Doc, um, and it's a long, it's a long way different from uh, the times uh, described there. But apart from uh, and Miller's Castle is obviously now gone as well. But Miller's Bridge uh, will be something that if you are local to the area, you will know. Yeah, but once upon a time, it was a, a hot spot for nude bathing. Nice. So that is my fact of the week this week. Thanks to Ken Pye, more Merseyside tales, etc. cetera. Uh, that is the late challenge this week as well. Uh, we do do a Liverpool show on a Monday live at five. So if you are a red and you want to... T- do you want to hear us talk more about football and specifically the Reds? Uh, come and join us for that. Plenty of viewers are joining us and that's been great to see. Uh, you can also, uh, of course, sign up for our Patreon as well for an extra show every week too. That is now done in the studio. Uh, we're still sort of working on the balances of all the shows, but I think we, we, we are getting there. But someone today decided to uh, park a Nissan Micra in the middle of the strand <laughs> and made me late for the studio. So we'll see how we got on with that. Uh, but yeah, sign up for that. I believe there's a free trial on there as well. Free still. trial now, yeah. yeah there's Any- a free t- to any trial. other packages, you can so do you can trial. you can you can basically get those uh, Patreon shows for free. You will have to share some details, and then it's the usual story, really. Of uh, if you like it, stay, and if you don't, cancel it. But you get to see behind the wall. You get to see uh, all the stuff we've done. There's thirty odd shows on there, cov- covering absolutely all kinds, from mental health and life and football to aliens. Um, Kopi doing mushrooms and God knows what else. Um, so yeah, t- check it all out. And also it keeps it going because uh, the Patreon is where we do get some income from all this. Uh, helps ke- helps it keep it all going, helps it all keep ticking over. Hopefully we can keep the whole thing going. Uh, and yeah, that's been the Late Challenge. See you again next week for the free show. Love you. Okay, bye.